from Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, from Twisted Sister, JJ French. With Gina Grad on news, Bald Brian on sound effects, and a round of Q and A's, courtesy of Stereo. And now, celebrating Hanukkah by spending the next eight days trying to spell Hanukkah. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get on your mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. Right, Gina Grad? That's right. Handball, Brian. Hey, now. Well, we, uh, somebody tweeted me a story out of Los Angeles, which is uh, absolutely bizarre from a timing standpoint, because uh, as you know, we had uh, Adam Ray in here. Mm -hmm. yesterday and his car was attacked by a homeless person wielding a hammer and then i proceeded to go on a diatribe about uh these building tools are weapons essentially and all the homeless people are building everything out in the street so they're going to have tools and thus they're going to have weapons then we discussed how surprise doesn't happen more often and then i went on to tell the story of max kellerman's brother who was Mm -hmm. killed by a guy named the harlem hammer with a hammer because he let him crash out on his sofa. And then I got the news story, which happened 12 hours after that discussion. And Dawson, you have it. A man was beaten to death with a hammer Wednesday night by a homeless suspect who he had allowed to live in the backyard of his South Los Angeles home. This is crazy wow. because Max Kellerman's brother allowed this guy to stay in his apartment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Holy moly. By the way, Garcetti, uh, Mayor Garcetti has been the genius who says, uh, hey, when these uh, prisoners are furloughed or released we owe them our gratitude and yes. hey why not let homeless people live on your lawn why not well, why not let homeless people live in your backyard yeah. here more we logical, go more logical argument might be that the people who are out of prison are back to zero right paid their debt right they really climbed their way back to even yes and uh yeah the kid uh, the homeless guy can just live in your kid's play castle in the backyard that's all right. Well, I'm sure the mayor's house has enough room and enough bedrooms in Larchmont that he can accommodate most of them. Oh, sure. yeah. All right. So or sorry. Or Park or wherever. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Getty House or whatever it's called. Go ahead. The violent murder co- occurred at about 6.30 p.m., 1,000 block of West 98th Street, according to sheriffs. Deputies responded to— Oh, it's 6.30 p.m.? 6.30 p.m. Oh, I thought Max Pet said uh, am or— uh, No, the, the article before. came out this morning, but oh, it was from uh, last night. The, wow. This, this uh, attack with the hammer happened about three or four hours after Jeez. we were talking about— Yep. Being attacked with a hammer. Deputies responded to a report of a fight to find the victim with a head injury in the backyard of his home. He died at the scene. The sheriff's deputy department reports he was not immediately identified. The male suspect was arrested a short distance away. Deputies learned that the victim had allowed the suspect, who was homeless, to live in his backyard. The two got into an altercation, and the suspect struck the victim in the head with a hammer and ran away. The suspect's name and the charges he faces were not immediately released. Well, thanks to our new DA, he'll be out and be issued a a court-approved hammer uh, when he's... uh, He'll get a Medal of Honor from Gaston, yeah. When he's he's paroled in uh, three days. As far as ways to go... I would very much not like to be killed by a hammer if it's all the same to you guys. Yeah, I'm kind of... uh... I, I kind of like the uh, hospital bed in my lavish living room surrounded mm-hmm. by great grandchildren. I think that's sure. got to be toward the top of the list. Right. And playmates or, you know, however half went. Yeah, however half went. So there you go. Homeless people, tools, hammers, violence, death. And uh, surprised, as we, I think, said yesterday, I'm surprised this shit doesn't happen more often. God, God's honest. And it's, well, it's gonna. I mean, it has to. Just more homeless, more weapons, more hammers, more hacksaws, and uh, more pry bars. And uh, here we uh, here we are, everybody. So um, I don't know. I feel like this could be a wake up call. Perhaps uh, we should we should snap into action. It won't. Uh, we do have yeah. rules, though. Now, you know, uh, I think 
the sign entering California should read uh, rules for those who follow rules, which is if, in fact, you pay your taxes or have a business or follow rules, then you just get more rules. And uh, I was informed that any business that has more than five employees has to have all of their employees undergo an online sexual harassment and workplace harassment uh, webinar, and it has to be completed, and it has to be turned in. Otherwise, you shall be in violation. Now, oh, you're not in violation. Kalen, K- bad news. You're out of job. <laughs> you're not in getting vi- under five. You're not in violation if, in fact, you want to live and defecate on the streets, and you're not in violation if you want to drive without a license, and you're not in violation if you would like to uh, sell food that you made at home out on the street with a shopping cart, but you shall be under violation if you do not comply with these sexual harassment rules. But you know they have to be comical. So I think we had uh, Megan at the other shop take the uh, survey or take the, I don't know what we're calling it, the the form Cor- a course course um, take the course Max Pad do you have that course Yeah I have some I have some screenshots here I'll just I'll just put them up So it it is a really annoying course where you can't fast forward through it and it has those automated <laughs> oh, voices no. that read you everything out loud oh. But here's the title card Sexual Harassment Prevention for Employees We have a uh, very varied array of of people as examples Yes, we have an Asian, two black men, a heavy set gal, and a, a lesbian, uh, I don't know, road worker, or is that a guy? I you can't would see it. fail this course <laughs> just, just in, in the first five seconds. Um, hey, where are the white women at? <laughs> yeah, there's no, well, there's one in the middle, but let's just let's go through it's a few of these slides. Are here. there any white men in this, uh, in this five yeah, shot? Yeah, there, there are. I'll, I'll, you'll see them. Well, who am I looking at on the home? Oh, page? not in this, not in this shot. Um, but in the in they, they use different people throughout the uh, throughout the slideshow. Okay, well it's important. This, yeah, this is just their opening title card. I, according to TV commercials and all these kind of uh, promos and pictures and stuff like that, in the last three years, it appears to me that black people represent seventy one percent of our population, but they're only thirteen percent. So it's always weird how uh, how heavily weighted it is whenever I see a commercial or one of these. But all right, go ahead. What are we going to learn? All right, so here are our two uh, like hosts or their, our guides. This is Nicole on the left. Uh huh. She's an attorney. Uh huh. And Brian is on the right, and yeah. he is the HR guy. Brian with an I. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and she's they introduce themselves and they say the topic of sexual harassment has been brought into the national spotlight again. With the hashtag MeToo movement, this has created renewed awareness about the serious and unacceptable nature of these actions. Mm, it's unacceptable. Well, there's a lot of things. You know, it's weird in a, in a uh, world uh, that is uh, essentially turned into Thunderdome. There's still a lot of things that are unacceptable that we have zero tolerance for. I wonder if the Weinstein agency uh, checked this out before the shit went down. But all right, here we go. All right, so... Uh, This is uh, Nicole. She says, in my job as an attorney, I'd found that workplaces that tolerate inappropriate, abusive, and demeaning conduct have more of it. Workplaces that do not tolerate inappropriate, abusive, and demeaning conduct have less of it. Uh, That's a pretty complicated uh, algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, Let me write that down. (laughs) I'm having trouble with her math. You should take notes. There are quizzes throughout. I was a little distracted because she's pretty hot. Yeah. You don't (laughs) see attorneys. Looking good that pants, dude. I mean, look, anyone is sat next to Mark Garagos on a flight knows attorneys don't look like that. But all right. Speaking of attorneys, we should ask Garagos, but on my hunch, and this would be racist if I was saying about someone else, but uh, my hunch is that the vast majority of sexual harassment is by uh, older white men, of which we see none in this this, uh, slideshow. That's a good point. So uh, she's saying if there is a... If there's a workplace that tolerates sexual harassment, there's going to be more sexual harassment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Slow down. All right. So let's just say, let me give you an example to make sure I'm I'm thinking this right. And then one that doesn't tolerate it, there'll be less. Yeah. According to her. So you're saying like if the workplace was vegan, there'd be less ribs? (laughs) Less vegan. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, all right. I think I follow you now. Okay. Good. Okay. good. Good. Here we go. All right. I wonder what this fucking cost us, by the way. 
And then and then she goes on to talk about creating a workplace of respect. All right. And here's some examples of rude behavior, unacceptable rude behavior. Not greeting people who say hello. By the way, do we really want the government to have dominion over wh- wh- how we greet people our, in our, our fucking etiquette. workplace? That seems bizarre. It, Almost unnecessary overreach. It's getting a little Orwellian here, people, but sorry. <laughs> and this stuff needs to be completed and turned in by when? Uh, there, there are about 130 of these slides. It takes about an hour, and you have to complete it before uh, January 1st, 2021. Or you'll be in violation. Yeah. It used to be 50 or more employees would have to do this. Now it's five or more. Is there a a business that could call themselves a business that has under five employees? I feel like that's not even really, that's you selling shit on eBay from your futon. All right, sorry. All right, also rude behavior, intentionally excluding someone from normal workplace conversations and making them feel unwelcome. Mm-hmm. Failing to say thank you, <laughs> interrupting coworkers, and responding with frequent sarcasm or anger to normal interactions. Oh, Adam, you're in violation, buddy. Yeah, They're coming after you. Hold on, dipshit. Is this real? <laughs> this is this. <laughs> this is actually also, Adam. This is for employees. There's actually an employer version that you're gonna have to watch. I don't. I'm gonna talk to Garagos about it. I don't like this fucking overreach i don't think i don't think the powers that be should be uh getting i mean they're fucking involved enough with our shit in california i don't think we need more of this i i think i might be uh i might i might uh, be a conscientious objector to this i'll talk to garros garros about it tomorrow yeah there's, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of manners and etiquette weird for sexual don't, harassment yeah, right? don't feel prosecutable <laughs> All yes. Right. Here's the first quiz. Uh, let's take a moment to think about your behavior. Do I fail to say thank you? Do I interrupt people? Do I pass judgment on others who are different? Do I put others down? Do I not treat everyone with respect? Do I make belittling comments? Do I reject feedback? Am I silent when others are being uncivil? Do I engage in microaggressions? Oh, boy. Do I yell? How, in the hold on. How does around? one define a microaggression? How how we eh. the problem with all this shit is there's going to be no such thing as you not being involved with a microaggression if someone accuses you of a microaggression. Hey, uh, well, Tim, he fucked up the microwave with a frozen burrito and then he just went home. Uh, I'm going to look at that as a microaggression. All right. <laughs> And then if you did not answer no, ask yourself, what could I have done differently to create a workplace of respect? And then there are a few different examples of, of um, people who have had sexual harassment or have been sexually harassed. Like this one, for instance, this is Kaya. Oh, and all these are like very, eth- like they're, they're like the robot voices, robot generated voices, but they're, they include really heavy accents. Oh, like really? Especially if they're oh, no. Asian oh, or, or, oh, no. or, or Latino. Also, Adam, or when's, the last, when's hmm. the last time you saw a very good looking petite Asian woman on the construction crew? Oh, I've seen them on chain gangs, but I've never seen them on uh, the Caltrans thing. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Here, uh, Gina, you should read this one because yeah. it's a female voice. I would definitely, okay. if this chick was anywhere near the cone zone, <laughs> I would definitely slow for the cone slow. zone. I might even come to a stop and rub one out. Fines are doubled. Mm-hmm. All right, this is what Kaya has to say. Mm-hmm. I'm Kaya. I work on a construction site as an engineer. Mm. Often, male employees make crude comments about women they see walking down the street. The construction workers make comments about women's breasts and buttocks and mm. whistle and catcall at women. Mm. They talk about hey, their sexual nice over I'm, the weekend. <laughs> I'm an elbows and knees man myself, but I get it. Oh, look at those joints. <laughs> Often showing nude pictures of the women they slept oh. with on their phones. All this makes me very uncomfortable. I asked my coworkers to stop this raunchy talk. The men told me to stay out of their business. I feel very hurt. <laughs> well, this is going to solve that's a lot extreme, of problems. That's a pretty extreme example of some very obvious sexual harassment. Hey, look at this nude the girl I banged. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is like a children's book with an adult theme, but it's yeah. written. Uh, do we have yeah. any... 
Do we have any audio of that no, weird well, accent? No, the thing is, it's like a different program, so I couldn't rip any of the stuff. Oh, okay. But uh, right. this is Alex. I'm Alex, and oh, I work at a where. Alex oh, is Alex. Is he also Asian? Yes, <laughs> yes. Alex is Asian, and his accent You're was heavy. Him. Oh, okay. But uh, Asians, exactly. Asians are like six percent of the population. Why? Why do we get two in a row? <laughs> All right. These are just a few of me. I'm Alex. I work at a, a warehouse stocking shelves. I would like to be a supervisor. Hold on a second. His Asian parents must be fucking devastated. <laughs> <It's> rough, <yeah. laughs> all that fucking tutors, all the time we spent uh, teaching you the piano, and you work fucking stocking shelves. I would like to be a supervisor and make more money. My boss, Gerald, told me that I am very cute and sexy. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Gerald also said if I went on a date with him that he could get me a job as a supervisor. I don't want to date Gerald. These comments made me uncomfortable, but I want a promotion. Since I want a promotion, I went on a date with Gerald, my boss. I need Ooh. 10 more slides. Mm. Well, <laughs> this storyline is Dawson. Dawson knows the phrase, no head, no backstage pass. You want you want to get kicked up that ladder. You got to blow you got to blow Gerald. I think Dawson has to read this one. You know, the game is played. Oh, we got a white guy. Yeah. Oh, he's got Dawson, his... I'm recruiting you. He's, he's... Dawson's getting his glasses. <laughs> he's wearing his, his name's Mike. He's wearing his indoor scarf, which I always like. <laughs> I like that look on a gent. It'll, it'll hey, make Mike, sense he's talking about you, you fuck ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mike, and I am gay. <laughs> I work in an office with a team of, of five men. Two of my coworkers tease me about how I dress. Hey, and so my it's, it's less than 50%. And my partner, James. They say I am not a real man. They also joke about me having sex with other men. Anytime there are new employees at the office, they tell them that I am gay. Well, by the way, uh, we can tell you're gay from outer space because you're wearing a scarf indoors. I am very uncomfortable with my team members. <laughs> yeah, this is a hostile work environment. Hey, you have sex with other men, men, because that makes you gay. <laughs> hey, welcome to the team. This is Mike. He's gay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh. All right, let's do one more. This All is right. Tony. This is Tony. Brian, you want to take it? Uh, no, because I can't read behind oh, okay, the boxes. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it is yeah, small. All right. right. This is Tony. I'm Tony. I'm a preschool teacher. My female colleagues, even fa even some of the parents of my students, keep making comments to me like, I'm surprised you work here. This is a job for women. Or, men are not usually nurturing of children. Or, if you want to do this job, you must be gay, right? Yeah, you gotta blow Gerald. <laughs> I try to laugh these comments off, but I don't like being boxed in by stereotypes about men. My boss, who hired me for this job, knows that I think these comments are inappropriate, but hasn't taken any action to stop them. Whoa, I'm what? sorry. Oh, you poor thing. Men aren't usually this nurturing of children. Great uh, job. Is that an insult? I don't know. What kind of fucking kindergarten is this that uh, <laughs> your boss won't intervene? Everyone's wow. dressed like appropriately for their job, except Tony, uh, who uh, is yeah. uh, dressed in a fucking nice suit. He's going to a funeral or a wedding. Yeah, he looks like the host at Nobu. Yeah, that's not who you are to preschool. <laughs> yeah, why is he uh, getting uh, getting all dampered up to go uh, teach one year old shit? Privilege, privilege. Oh, uh, white privilege. That's all right. right, but is he gay, or we just call him gay because he's working with the uh, young he's a kids? Confirmed bachelor. We shouldn't even ask. We that. shouldn't. Ask. Oh, you're right. None you're of your right. P's and Q's. Right. So what's etiquette? I would see him and go, "You're not gay, are you?" <laughs> would that be cool? Is that? I don't know. I'm asking. Yeah. You're just right. asking. <laughs> I'm just asking. All right, everybody. This is where we're at. This goes on for an hour. <clears throat> now, uh, this is going to be mandatory. It is mandatory. And then if you don't comply, you're going to get into trouble. Just like if you opened your restaurant for outdoor dining, they will pull your liquor license. It's, uh, it's a lot of overreach here. A lot of overreach. I don't know. I say it every time. Not sure why it's attractive. Don't know why you think uh, we're heading toward a brighter future with the government just sort of controlling everything, yeah. like a little less uh, regulation and a little more business. But uh, I don't know. People seem to like it this way. And and by the way, everyone's just going to work for the government because why the fuck would you run a business anymore? 
You can't. It's just like you can't run a business. That I, I, I don't. Is the gov is the government's end game just to get everyone to work for the government and have no tax base? Like I, I don't know what their plan is. We talked about it before, but the obvious answer is the lawyers. The lawyers get involved. Do you want to avoid a lawsuit or at least mitigate a lawsuit? Have everyone take this uh, quiz or survey or course or whatever. Right, but it's unnecessary because the government's imposing it on small businesses. So small businesses so, are going to have to deal with HR stuff their own. I don't know. This is please the government. Otherwise, there's going to be punitive shit. I'm going to talk yeah. to Mark about this. My my thing would be fuck you. Fix the fucking homeless problem. Fix the traffic shit and leave me the fuck alone. And everyone should just go fuck off. I'm not doing this fucking shit. These are fucking retarded assholes, and they've proven themselves to be wildly incompetent anyway. Yeah, the, the, the website is so poorly done. Like, you, you watch these five-minute videos, weirdly all produced and starring David Schwimmer, and, <laughs> and you have to sit through the credits after each one. There's like a couple minutes oh, of credits at the end well, of each video they have to just sit through. The bad news is they're poorly produced, but the good news is I bet we paid top dollar <laughs> for, for whoever developed this website. All right, is uh, J.J. French, the uh, guitarist and uh, manager from uh, Twisted Sister, uh, ready to jump on? J.J.? J.J., who's a founding member of Twisted Sister and guitarist, also took over as the band's manager from in 1975, which... Uh, Seems like a couple of hats to wear. Seems like a difficult gig, but we'll talk to JJ about it. JJ, whenever you can hear us. I'm here. Oh, good, man. I'm, I'm good. No, no. We're all good. How we're are all you? good, man. It's nice to know that you rock guys show up late. Yeah, you know, we're sorry. here. Sorry. It's okay. We're always getting blamed for that shit, right? We're always like, where are you guys, man? You know? I had a chance to do Celebrity Apprentice with D. Schneider, I believe. And uh, I found him to be a nice guy and a really dedicated worker. Uh, how you doing? How's the, oh, and a car guy, I guess, is uh, well. Uh, what's what's going on with Twisted Sister? I know COVID has fucked everything up, but uh, was there tours canceled and dates canceled? Well, well, okay. So first of all, Adam, thanks for having me on. Sure. Okay. And and hel helping me enter your world because this is your world. You're the king of this world, and I am just merely a pawn. The right now i'll give so. your podcast a plug the french connection the music business and beyond it's available now on apple podcast spotify and podcast one so uh yeah twisted sister what's the what's the status so here's the deal here's the deal right so the band uh, started uh 48 years ago wow and, uh, i i need ibuprofen just to say that okay uh -huh. But I auditioned to be in the band, and um, I was the last original member of the band, and and uh, I joined in 1972. Wow. And um, a little fun fact, uh, are you a Bob Marley fan, Adam? No, but I'm well aware of him. Yes, and I and. Like, and I like the doc. Okay. Well, here we go. In 1973, what did Twisted Sister and Bob Marley have in common? The answer is no, we did not both wear dresses. The answer is that the drummer for Twisted Sister and the brother for Bob Marley were brothers, and the guitar player for Bob Marley were brothers. Really? Wow. The Anderson brothers, yeah. Al Anderson was the guitar player for, he took over for Bunny Whaler's spot, and our drummer was Mel Anderson, his brother. And when I asked when I went to the first Twisted rehearsal and he told me that his brother was playing with Bob Marley, I said, I thought you got to be Jamaican mm -hmm. to be in Bob Marley's band. These guys are from Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And he said, my brother put on a fake Jamaican accent and got hired. And that's. <laughs> you could do that, Jamaica Queens, I guess. Right. Well, that might be. Able to, so that's how we getting. got the gig. Um, and then the band struggled in the bars for 10 years. You know, our documentary, we are a twisted fucking sister kind of tells that whole story. The band made it in 80. Three, we got signed a record deal. By 88, the whole thing fell apart. And um, D and I were estranged for a long time. You know, and I, I uh, lovingly uh, uh, refer to him as uh, Je Sarah Jessica Parker dipped in a vat of acid. That's how I describe uh, his, his image. In fact, that's how I introduce him on stage because I read it in a review somewhere. And I said, that's the funniest shit I've ever heard in my life, you know. So, uh, and he is a typical lead singer in many ways. Um, he is a nice guy. He fools everyone. No, he actually is. A particularly nice guy. It took him a long time to get there. We just did a show. I just had him on my show. As a matter of fact, um, he'll be on a twisted. He'll be on my JJ friend show uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, my podcast. Um, then the band went into like a cold storage for twelve years. We didn't talk. 
Uh, and I thought that I would never get back together again. I mean, the band had a horrible breakup. You know, there was lawsuits and bankruptcies and all the shit that you would hear on a behind the music kind of story mm -hmm. happened to Twisted Sister. And um, I mean, it got really bad. I mean, we weren't talking. I'll give you an example of how bad it got. Uh, I'm a New York guy. You know, so I walk down the street and I see guys from New York. They're like, hey, fucking JJ, when are you guys getting back together again? You know, when are you doing it? I said, it's not happening. We, we're not getting it. Come on, man. Everyone's got a number. I said, there's no number. There's no number. There's no money. You can't put us back. Oh, fuck that. Everybody's got a number. What's your number? I said, let me ask you something, asshole. You ever been married? He goes, yeah. I said, you divorced? He goes, yeah. I said, how much would it take for you and your ex-wife to go on a bus for 30 days? You couldn't fucking pay me enough to do that. <laughs> Arrest my case. So the band didn't talk for 12 years and then 9-11 occurred and the band got together to raise money for the New York City Police and Fire Department mm. uh, because we're all New York guys. Right. You know, AJ is from Staten Island, Eddie's from the Bronx, I'm from Manhattan, D and Mark are from Queens. It's fucking New York. They didn't want heavy metal bands at the Garden. I don't know if you remember that benefit with The Who and Paul McCartney. They did not want heavy metal bands there. They said we were too aggressive. I say, excuse me, the fucking buildings were just knocked down. Um, right. Can we be a little pissed off here? You know, Let's talk we? about aggressive. Right. So um, we did our own with Eddie Trunk being the host. Actually, Eddie put it together. The beauty of that was that Twisted Sister had just done a documentary behind the music in which we had finally unleashed the hatred within the band. Like it was broadcast two weeks before 9-11 and it was brutal because the band wasn't a drug band. So we had to do something to amplify the, the discourse and the amplification was that we hated each other's guts. So mm -hmm. this came out in September 2nd of 2001 and then 9-11 occurs and Eddie Trunk calls me. He says, hey, man, I saw the documentary. Jesus Christ, you guys fucking hate each other. I said, yes, we do. He said, well, if you could get together for a benefit, it would be great. And we did. The uh, reality of that was that the world cared more than we understood. And we came back and we were supposed to do one year as a reunion. And instead, we had a 14 year reunion. Oh. And we toured and we came bigger than we ever were. We rec we released a Christmas record. I don't know if you heard the Twisted Christmas, but, you yes. know, only Jews make the best Christmas record, oh. as, we, as we all know. Uh, yeah, well, Chestnuts Roasting on Open Fire was supposed to be latkes floating in a sea of oil, but I don't think that original line was <laughs> ever put in there. So we did a Christmas album that everyone thought would bomb, but it turns out that Dee stole the melody for We're Not Gonna Take It from Come All You Faithful. So we basically <laughs> took the We're Not Gonna Take It track and we just redid a couple of chord progressions and it's Come All You Faithful. So the record was a hit, the video was a hit, the album was a hit, biggest selling Christmas album, heavy metal Christmas album, and the band toured and toured and toured and toured. And I thought, oh, my God, this 80s thing has got to be over in a year or two years or three years. And it kept getting bigger and bigger. Adam, I don't know if you know the size or the love of metal around the world, not in the U.S., but around the world. And Europe, yeah, I, it's, Europe yeah. it's a big. Yeah. I, yeah, I I definitely get it. I've seen a few docs and, yeah, they're bands that uh, are appreciated here, but beloved in uh many other places, countries, and it's always kind of hard to figure out why, you know, whenever I talk to a band, I'll ask them like, where are you big? And they'll just go Brazil. And I'll go, why? And they'll go, I don't know. Well, I can kind of answer that question yes, in a way. Please. First of all, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Holland, uh, Belgium, we play to regularly 60 to 100,000 people a night. Wow. In these countries. And we could do it tomorrow if there was no COVID and we chose to play. Uh, they they worship it as a lifestyle choice. They never walked away from it. 80s metal was derided by critics, as we all know, like shit music, except that it was a people's music in a way. It's very populist. And around the world, it resonated. And as big as we are in all of these countries, especially in Europe, where we're, we have we've got stuff online so people could see it, these, these German festivals and these uh, and also Twisted Sisters loved by death metal bands, which is something that Motley Crue and Poison are not necessarily loved by, but they love us because our first album had all these nihilistic songs like Destroy Our Knife in the Back, Kill or Be Killed. So we've endeared ourselves to the black metal side of the planet, even though we're a bunch of Jews from Long Island to play soccer with our kids and, you know, have nothing particularly in common, but they love this stuff. So we appear on, on death metal festivals. But here's the crazy part. We get to South America. Now, I don't know if you know anything about South America, but if you're ever curious why ACDC and Iron Maiden, even Madonna, have their DVDs recorded in Buenos Aires, it's because they are flat out freaking the most insane 
fans in the world. They're they're live stuff. They're live CDs. They record in front of a live crowd, and you want the bit. You want the best live crowd. So, you know, if you're stand up and you're recording a stand up special. You go to a town that's good for you. You know, there's not many recorded in Los Angeles because Los Angeles is kind of notoriously shitty town. So you end up going to Boston or Chicago, and that's why all the stand-up specials. So if you're doing a live record, a live CD, you want the most raucous crowd. I don't know a ton about Brazil. I know I, I know it fairly well from Fast and Furious 6, <laughs> but that's about all I got. Well, I got to tell you, we are so big in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile, um, in, in Bolivia. It's insane. I mean, the problem, of course, in South America is that you never really know how many records you sell because I guess the record labels assume there's corruption. So, you know, you have gold and platinum records from around the world, and each one of them says, thank you for selling 15,000 a million in America, in Finland, it's 15,000. In, in New Zealand, it's 25,000. It's a number. They but in Mexico, it, yeah. in Mexico, it just says, por favor de los muchos recordos de los Mexico, which means thank you for selling many records because <laughs> right. no one knows how many records they sell. This is a true story. I said to my rep, I said, how come there's no number? He goes, because we have no freaking clue. We just kind of license it out and hope that somebody makes their money back. And we have enormous popularity. In fact, our number one Spotify country is Mexico. Gina, is question? Really wow. I'm curious about this. I, I have no idea if I'm way off track here, so please feel free to wrangle me. But when we're talking about why these countries, and you know, Sweden doesn't exactly fit the bill, but I'm wondering if there is, it, it sounds like there might be um, some intersection of um, government oppression, at least perceived that way, and, and people wanting to rebel against that with rock music. I, I'm still trying to figure out why these countries are are still, they. it's it's so personal for them when it's just fun for us. Well, I'll tell you, it's fun for them. Uh, what's really unusual for, for me, uh, because I am a manager, so that means I'm watching everything, right? I'm right. looking and trying to figure out. I talk to people. I want to know what the secret sauce is. You know, why in America is it so... Um, you know, so categorized in a, in a small little compartment, a heavy right. metal band, hair band, derided, niche. right. niche thing, doesn't get any radio play, gets no respect, nobody cares, you know, rock is dead in America. Why is it you go to Europe, you go to the festivals in Europe, most festivals, anywhere from 60 to 100,000 people, and it's multi-generational, it's parents and their kids and their kids, and it's really crazy, right? But the age range in America, essentially for a band like us, is seriously 50 to 75, that makes right? Sense. It didn't mm -hmm. get passed but, down the way it's But in down. Europe, it is seriously uh, 15 yeah. to 75. But in South America, and this is the craziest part, it's actually 15 to 25. So mm. in South America, when you're playing soccer stadiums, you are playing to kids who were not born when our records were recorded. And when I ask them, I will walk out of the hotel when I'm not with my bodyguards, and uh, cause you need them down there for reasons that you can just imagine. It's crazy sure. you know, in a hotel, but when you ask them and you go, why us? And they go, we love Motley Crue. We love Judas Priest. We love ACDC. We love black Sabbath. We love, you know, this is a, a, a lifestyle decision that a broad demographic of South American kids have decided is their love. And you know, what's strange. They don't love the new versions of heavy metal bands. They don't care that there's Trivium and other bands. They don't really care. They want their Motley Crue, their Judas Priest, their Twisted Sister, their Kiss, their ACDC. <clears throat> they worship it, and they show up in droves. Now, we get to Bolivia. Do you guys know anything about La Paz, Bolivia at all? In Fast and Furious 4. Great. Uh, all right. Yeah. So here's no. the deal with Bolivia. You can't breathe. There's no freaking you land in La Paz. It's 12,000 feet above sea level. All right. So we're a bunch of old Jewish guys. I mean, we're not like 20-year-old soccer players, you know? So we're playing in Chile the night before, and I'm doing a radio show, and the guy says to me, where are you playing tomorrow? I said, La Paz. And he goes, you playing La Paz? I said, yeah. He goes, we're not going to take it. <laughs> no. I said, what does that mean? He goes, you will find out tomorrow. <laughs> the plane lands. They open the plane door, and you can't breathe. It's 12,000 no square, uh, sorry, 12,000 feet above sea level. Feet, yeah. That's insane. So we can't breathe. So we get up out of our seat. I'm like, <gasps> <gasps> we walk outside, <sighs> and there's a hospital there at the airport. 
They strap oxygen tanks on us, right? There's thousands of kids and the army is there to escort us to the hotel. And in the cars are oxygen tanks. So me and AJ are in one car, D Mark and Eddie are in another car. We all have oxygen tanks and we're going to the hotel and all of a sudden our car splits from the other car. And I thought we were getting kidnapped. I thought for sure, this is it. My wife will get a letter and you know, do you wanna see him alive, whatever. Well, it turns out that the security is so paranoid there. They split the, the traveling group right. up to just avoid any problems. We get to the hotel and there's oxygen tanks in the hotel room, right? In the hotel room. Now we're supposed to go on that night, that night. I said to the promoter, what's up with that? And he goes, well, you know, um, when soccer teams come to play, they do three days of acclimation. I said, that's 22 year old guys, right. three days of acclimation. We're 60 year old guys from New York. He goes, well, you want some cocaine? <laughs> and I said, are you serious? We'll, we'll, we'll drop dead. I said, that's not in the cards. He goes, that's too bad. It's $6 a gram. And I said, <laughs> you're leaving money said, on the table. And I said, that is too bad. I said, that's a horrible story. And he goes, and it's not stepped on me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Talks him to go. That's that Bolivian, Bolivian shale. <laughs> and I said, I said, you guys grow this behind the police station. <laughs> and he goes, probably. Anyway, the thing is we did the show and here's the, here's the deal. So we're on stage, right? Under normal circumstances, I run around stage, except I can't run. I can barely walk. The mic stands 15 feet away. We're not going to take it starts. I very slowly <laughs> walk up and go, we're not going to take it. Was, it was amongst the fans are unbelievable. I got to tell you, the next day in the local paper, on the national paper, the national Bolivian paper, we were on the front cover and the back cover. They said greatest concert they've ever seen. I don't understand how they could think that because we couldn't breathe. However, I will say that the South American fans are beyond the most incredibly religiously connected fans a band could, could ever want. Wow. Yeah, it's funny how we sort of tapped into that and they are, or maybe that, you know, I don't know, maybe they're just more passionate in general. Maybe that's they, the word. Maybe Adam, they that just, is the word. Passionate about everything. Passionate. Right. Yes. Versus uh, my family. JJ French is the name, the French connection, the music business and beyond. It's a new podcast available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Podcast One. Uh, I would recommend it because, uh, if as you've just heard, JJ is a world class storyteller and uh, certainly the funniest band manager I've ever come across. So, uh, and his hey, website. Adam, can, I leave yes. you, can I leave you with a great lead singer joke yes. before we go? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, there's three great lead singer jokes. One is, how does a lead singer change a light bulb? And the answer is, he holds a bulb in one hand and waits for the world to revolve around him. That's <laughs> one. Awesome. The second one is, what's the difference between a terrorist and lead singer? And the answer is you can negotiate with the terrorist. Okay, that's the second one. But the third one is kind of like um, an offshoot of another one, but hopefully you'll understand this. So this goes out to all bands with lead singers who will try to understand the mentality of why you have a lead singer. And to be fair to my singer, my singer told me this joke. Okay, <laughs> so it's not out of, it's not out of school, but it is, says everything about a band and a lead singer. And I will leave you with this last story. And I thank you for having me on your show. You suck. Thank you. Thank you so much. So here's the story. A hotel clerk is standing there and a tour manager runs up to him and says, I got to get the key to room 201 because my singer's not getting up and we have a big show in the arena this morning, uh, this evening, and we got to get him up. And the hotel clerk looks at him and says, sir, you know as well as I do, your lead singer was found dead in the hotel room this morning. Tour manager walks away, comes back five minutes later and says, I got to get the key to room 201. We got this big show. He's not answering the phone. Hotel clerk says, sir, I understand this is traumatic news for you and all those millions of fans around the world, but you know that the lead singer was found dead in the hotel room this morning. Guy walks away, comes back five minutes later. I need the key to room 201. I got to get my singer up. Hotel clerk goes crazy, grabs the guy by the lapel, says, listen to me carefully. All right. Your lead singer is dead. Do you hear me? Yeah. Your lead singer is dead. Do you understand those words? Yeah. Why do you keep asking me to repeat it? And he says, because I love the way it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> JJ French, everybody. <laughs> Tip your waiters. Take care, guys. Thanks, Thank JJ. you so much. Thank Great. you, man. Uh, bye bye. That guy's funny. <laughs> I love that joke. All right. We have uh we have the accents from the sexual harassment oh, slides gosh. that uh Chris has pulled up. First, let me tell you about uh Meter Holidays, the official uh 
put on the sweats and hang around the house and uh, eat a little meat, man. Uh, it's here, Bluetooth meat thermometer. That's meter. Keeps uh, keeps an eye on your holiday food and lets you know when it's ready. Brian's been a fan for years of this product. I'm new on to it. The, the mm. real advantage is in the winter time, you know, December, January, February. Why it makes a good Christmas gift? You, if you're barbecuing, if you're committed to having that, you know, grilled or whatever, pop it in there. Bluetooth on your phone. And you can just watch from your couch. Like watch the temperature just go up. It'll ding when it's ready. It's it's pretty amazing. Uh, they got a probe. It's got two temperature sensors along with the meter app you put on your phone. It gives you the uh, countdown on your phone, as Brian just said. It's a perfect tool for cooking. Holiday feast, perfect gift, too. Yeah, nice gift. Get 15% off with code ACS at meter.com. Right, Dawson? Get 15% off with code ACS at M-E-A-T-E-R.com. 15% off when you use code ACS at meter.com. Let meter help you. Let meter help make your holiday meals absolutely perfect. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back. We'll do the news. But right before the news, we'll uh, play you some of those uh, funny accent sexual harassment slides. We'll do that right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, Adam, have you seen the drug commercial with the two smoking hot, well put together chicks bonding over their schizophrenia symptoms? Figured you might have some thoughts about that one. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Yeah, it's crazy. We're seeing commercials for schizophrenia medication. Like, it's the cute chick. She's at the park. There's a guy selling hot dogs. Another guy's, like, taking pictures, and she thinks she's a spy and taking pictures of her and paranoid. Oh, yeah. yeah I just see this. So I thought it was a movie trailer. <laughs> it's a crazy... <laughs> It's a crazy commercial. It's good looking. Oh, she's having hallucinations, isn't she? Yeah. She thinks she's Talk being about a snapshot on. of where we are. Oh, God. All right. We'll play that clip. We'll play a couple of those uh, accent clips, which I haven't heard. Yeah, here we go. So this is uh, Alex, the warehouse worker, telling, telling the story himself. <laughs> Gerald. <laughs> I'm Alex, and I work at a warehouse stocking shelves. I would like to be a supervisor and make more money. My boss, Gerald told me that I'm very cute and sexy. Gerald also said if I went on a date with him that he could get me a job as a supervisor. I don't want to date Gerald. These comments made me uncomfortable, but I want a promotion. Since I want promotion, I went on a date with Gerald, my boss. Jesus. This is creepy and weird. Wait, they, they, they programmed the accent into the automated computer voice? I don't know. Like, uh, Definitely uh, Nicole and Brian, the two guides, those are totally programmed because they say the same words with the same cadence throughout mm-hmm. the entire thing. Jesus. But yeah, this is what you're, you're going you're gonna to like this That's one then, offensive. Brian. Offensive. <laughs> Toss, you should have got that gig. <laughs> I know. This is Anna. I'm Anna. I am an undocumented immigrant and clean buildings at night. One night, my boss told me to clean a bathroom. I was alone, and my boss followed me into the bathroom. Hold on, pause it for a second. Yeah, cleaning a bathroom is not a team sport, so you're almost always going to be alone in that stall. I just want to give people a heads up, you know? When you're cleaning... The plot thickens. No no one's ever cleaned a toilet and went, uh, hey, get a little little hand here. Hold the the cleanser and the brush. Plenty of room. Plenty of room. All right, here we go, sir. In clean buildings at night. One night, my boss told me to clean a bathroom. I was alone, and my boss followed me into the bathroom. He pushed me against the wall and grabbed my breasts. Luckily, I escaped. Later, he threatened to have me deported if I did not have sex with him. Wow. I am terrified. It doesn't get more sexual harassment than that. that. That's textbook sexual harassment. This is like... Yeah, this is this is beyond. There's a That's lot extreme. of yeah. There's a lot of range in these videos. First, you're getting into trouble for not saying howdy to a coworker, and now That's you're right. pushing people against a bathroom stall and copping a feel, and threatening to have them deported. Threat, yeah. A lot of range in this uh, this oh, yeah. criminal behavior. All right, we got Ooh. one more. Yeah, we can do one more. This is Anton. Anton. Oh, I was hoping I, I was hoping he was black. Pardon. Sorry. Go ahead. My co-workers and I get drinks after work at a local bar on Friday afternoons. 
At the bar, Sandy, my boss, rubbed my thigh under the table and reminded me that in the next month management will be deciding who gets to work in the off-season. I backed away and felt frozen. I am not interested in Sandy and felt uncomfortable but don't want to say anything. I'm sensing a theme. But let me ask you this. I don't be devil's advocate, but let's say you go out to a bar with some coworkers after work and your manager, Sandy, starts rubbing your inner thigh and you are interested in Sandy. Does that it's make it OK? Day. It's a yeah. great day. That's it's a great day but does that excuse Sandy's behavior? Like they always do this thing where it's like, uh, yeah, they go. She uh, my supervisor dropped a dry digit on my uh, anus and then they go and I'm not interested in this person. I don't know. I don't feel like that should factor in. I feel like it's still, it could be a good day for you, but it doesn't excuse Sandy. That's right. Also, I feel horrible. He's still on the hook for this. I've been in every work environment possible. No one's ever fucking dropped a digit on me or put their hand on my thigh or uh, uh, told me I know how the game was played or, or anything. I, didn't, I got But I wait, got how, did, how did you get promoted to cabinetry from the ditch digging? Oh, I had to blow a guy named Russ. Okay. That's what I thought. Were you interested in Ross? Well, I was interested in not digging ditches anymore. There you go. Well, he knows how the game is played. So I'll call that win-win for me and Ross. All right, should we uh, do our intro for the news? Give me the news with Grad. News with Gino Grad. Breaking viral. All those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gino Grad. Trouble in the Middle East. Celebrity drunk meltdowns. Need news with Gina Gino Grad. The news with Gina Grad. Well, this story is a, all about perspective. It's either tragic or awesome, depending on how you look at it and who you ask. A test rocket that Elon Musk one day hopes to send to Mars successfully launched Wednesday in Boca Chica, Texas, and flew several miles into space, but then exploded when attempting to land. And I'll, I'll show you the video of that. But despite the explosion, SpaceX termed it an awesome test in a message across the screen. And the broadcast added, congratulations. Starship team. We're watching it right now. It's going down. There's uh, cameras from every angle. It's about to hit the ground and a big old fiery explosion. Ooh. Yeah. And so, depending on who you ask, success, not success, Elon says this was a good day and, uh, you know, get him next time. Well, I think he probably would say this aspect of it worked, the launch work, this, right. this particular technology worked. And then that, you know, and bringing a, a rocket back down to the ground that way, is just a Herculean task. And so far there's just no way to propel a rocket without just tons of super high explosive fuel. There is no, well, Yes, you're right. And, and I, I can't think of it off the top of my head. What did they launch that they successfully brought down basically on the head of a pin? What was that? Uh, I don't know the name, but true story. Uh, a very good friend of mine uh, used to use guys SpaceX employee number 12 or something. He was like he joined it up at the very beginning. And uh, he used to be uh, on the team that was in charge of retro rockets that would land the rockets. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of one of those things out of we talk about movers where you're like no one notices if you do a good job, but if you dent or whatever, right. you know, you're all over your ass. Like, yeah, it's spectacular and kind of whatever when the thing, you know, la you know, crash lands or doesn't make the landing. But uh, uh, I, I do know for a fact they landed several rockets successfully. Falcon 9, I think. Mm -hmm. I took a I took a tour of SpaceX several years ago. It was like one I of know, the, he was there. Well, yeah, one of the most impressive things I've ever seen, and uh, had, uh, also when I took a tour of uh, Dan Gurney's shop, uh, I saw some SpaceX production going on over there as well. So it's it's very interesting. Look, I. Uh, I think we all like this stuff, right? Just oh, innovation yeah. and moving sure. forward and, and the notion that, you know, once the you leave it up to the government, it's going to take 25 years. Elon's going to do it in six. You know, we kind of, I, I like that. I like that. I love all the I love all the shit like the X Prize. You know, yes. they just have a competition. Really We're going to see if we mm -hmm. can get this plane to be powered by the sun and go over the ch English Channel and mm -hmm. carry two people. And it's like everyone just goes at it. And then next thing you know, you get a ton 
of technology. All right, what else how we got, many, Gina? Sorry. How many NDAs did you have to sign when you took the tour? You had to, <clears throat> you had to have signed something. I don't uh, don't recall. I mean, they don't the gentlemen's agreement. They don't let you into the areas that they don't yeah. want you That's in. It. You know, I didn't uh, that that they do, but it's pretty much seemed wide open, and it was just so much precision going on. I mean, the tolerances and how everyone machined everything. I mean, it's just oh. so goddamn impressive. You were probably too messed. Yes, I was. So Wait a minute, let's... Gina. You may have crossed the line. No. Sexually. No. As soon as I look Wait, up to, are you I interested? Said, I said probably. After I look up to mess and we, I may <laughs> contact an attorney. True. See that you do. So let's stick with space for a second. A secret group called the Galactic Federation has convinced President Trump that humanity is not ready to learn the truth regarding extraterrestrials as the Galactic Federation feared mass hysteria. And this is according to the Jerusalem Post and made headlines in the last, I'd say, 48 hours. That's only two of the explosive claims made by this retired Israeli uh, General Chaim Eshed, who headed the count, uh, the country's space security program for nearly 30 years. He said Trump launched the Space Force because of this alien invasion. So supposedly, if you believe General Eshed, extraterrestrials are camped underground on Mars with American astronauts. For years, the aliens have communicated with authorities. They made a secret pact. While these otherworldly visitors research our societies, governments on Earth are trying to get humans to evolve enough to comprehend what space and spaceships are. So we talk about this a lot. And apparently, according to some, some retired generals who now want to want to tell all this is already very much happening um what do you think i'd like to see a little more documentation uh, on this particular one before i, yeah. I go in uh, before, before i go pot committed it's funny you know it's an interesting time with generals and doctors so i was uh i was saying this to someone the other day but i had no idea there'd be this many kooky dumb doctors and I had no idea there'd be this many kind of tell-all generals. When I was a kid, if you were a general or a doctor, oh. if you were a doctor, you're the smartest person in the land. And if you're a general, you're the most stoic person there was. Yep. And you would never rat anyone out or talk, tell tales out of school or just you know, write a book and then try to sell it by you know putting some salacious shit in it. I think it's kind of game on now with generals oh, and doctors. Yeah. Absolutely. And, but if you're thinking about like the Israeli Defense Force, like they don't mess around. So is this guy nuts or is he just ready to not keep secrets anymore? Well, living underground on Mars with yeah. American astronauts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the explanation could do you more harm to your cause. Like Scientology, like oh, it's a new religion. It's about positivity and blah, blah, blah. And right. self -wonder. Like, How nice. Yeah. What happened was it's a fucking space alien who lives under the right. ground. Okay. You lost me. Same you with this. Like, oh, we made contact with aliens. Wow. Interesting. Tell me more. Well, they're living on Mars <laughs> with Americans. With our people. Oh, but I do believe. Okay. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that when somebody, when a president is inaugurated, that they get, you know, the big tome to all this extraterrestrial stuff? Or do you think that that's not real? Because I believe it. I'm fairly agnostic. I, we saw footage taken from fighter jets recently <laughs> about things that moved in a certain way that nothing we're aware of could move as. Then I think we had some ballistic jet expert mm -hmm. guy call in and tell us about these drones Shit on our parade right that it could do this i feel like almost every time there's something that sounds fairly convincing there's somebody debunking it so yeah. i'm always just kind of caught in the middle i would i will put it to you this way i would not be surprised if if that was in fact uh what happened or what happens but pretty, pretty cool but I don't know. We'll find out because I feel like uh, if Joe Biden gets this information and uh, we let him get on a couple of years and then we uh, sweat him during a news conference, he's liable to crack. Yeah, We're just going to yeah. shout like he makes some fun, something about corn pop or something. Yeah. He's like, hey, buddy, I got alien friends. Come over there. Take you behind the gym. 
They're here. And, they're already here. And that's the problem. <laughs> Hiding in plain sight with old Joe Biden. Nobody's yeah. going to believe him anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, let me hit uh, life lock here, Gina, and then we'll keep going. Uh, right. Practice safe online holiday shopping. Only shop websites with URLs that start with HTTPS. And have a locked padlock icon to the left of the URL. Don't overshare. No online retailer needs your social security number or date of birth. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. These holidays, you could miss certain identity threats by just monitoring your credit and bank statements alone. LifeLock helps detect a wide range of identity threats like your social security number for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information is being used in their network, they'll send you an alert. Protect yourself with LifeLock, right, Dawson? No one can all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but LifeLock can help you feel warm and protected this holiday season. Save up to 25% off your first year at LifeLock.com with promo code Adam. That's 25% off at LifeLock.com. Promo code Adam. What else we got, Gina? We got some good news and bad news for Russians and um, for all of us, but this might be tougher on them. People all over the world are hopeful that this COVID vaccine will lead us back to some semblance of a normal life. But it's leaving Russians in a tough spot because they have to choose between vaccine or vodka. Because health officials are warning people that if they receive the Russian-made Sputnik V vaccine, they will have to give up booze for like two months because alcohol could weaken the immune system. Uh, No word yet from Pfizer or Moderna whether Americans will also need to stay sober with this cocktail, no pun intended, that we're going to get. But with Russians, very important that they don't drink for two months after taking the Sputnik V vaccine. I, uh, I have a theory about this which is Russia probably drinks more than any society on the planet. Obviously, it's going to have big-time effects on the country, productivity, health care, things like that. I think every time Russia comes out with something or recommends something, like they go, you can use this preparation H, but now listen. You can't it's drink beware. for two no weeks b- before you applied, and then two weeks. I think they probably say that about you want to buy a bus ticket, you want to enroll your kids in school, you want to buy a fishing hat. Okay, okay, but here's the caveat. I, they probably just do that because they're probably desperately trying to get people to drink less. Yeah. Because oh, I, I, I don't know what on a m- molecular level is going on with their vaccine versus our vaccine. And we've heard no discussions about not drinking. Also, as far as I can tell from the Russians, uh, you tell the populace no drinking before you get the vaccine and after you get the vaccine. You're not you're going to be in single digits in terms of uh, folks that are gonna... getting that vaccine. <laughs> also. Yeah. <clears throat> As somebody who likes to tilt a few, I don't like the general umbrella where they go, well, drinking lowers your blah, blah, you know, drinking your immune system. So then they go, don't drink. And then they just say for everything. So, you mm-hmm. know, if there's ever an issue, there's ever a problem, whatever, it's just don't drink because it's sort of like saying it's not going to help. But my feeling right. I used to say to Dr. Drew all the time when, uh, Medications. Remember when medications all had the alcohol X oh, thing on the martini yeah, glass? The martini. Yep. What happened? Did something happen to that? Did Trust it, me, question. there's still some specialty medications out there that do that, <laughs> <laughs> but not they're not the average aspirin or or whatever. Tom. Didn't it? Yeah. It didn't feel like I felt like any time there was a prescription medication I got, it had the martini glass with the. Maybe they just stamped it on mine. <laughs> they knew who they, they were doing profiled it. you. That's a that's a great bit from Arrested Development with the mom uh, played by Jessica Waters, who's a kind of an alcoholic, you know, waspy older lady, and she's taking medication, and it has like a kind of a a drowsy eyed person right. with the martini. It says Jason Bateman says, but instead, my mother took that as a winking eyed suggestion. <laughs> well, I would always say to Doctor Drew, I need clarity because. Is it the no martinis because it's going to jack you up, meaning this uh, sleeping pill is going to seem like five sleeping pills? Or is it because it's going to have a reaction and destroy my liver? Right. I want to know because I'd like to make a responsible choice. (laughs) An informed choice. An informed choice. I'm sitting here strategizing if if, if, uh, 
Yeah, just doing some ballpark math. If the uh, co- if the vaccine is available in the spring or the late winter, uh, the best time to take it would be early to mid February because you, you get the Super Bowl, you can drink at the Super Bowl party, but then it's gonna two months is gonna be done before Cinco de Mayo. So you got that oh. sweet spot. If listen, if you have to go Thank two you, months, Brian. yeah, you gotta yep. go between Super Bowl and Cinco de Mayo. It's All important. right, I'll tell the Russians. <laughs> Or you're talking about here. I get it. I'm talking. Yeah, I don't know if either one of those are very important to Russians. (laughs) Speaking of COVID, uh, more animals testing positive. This time, lions at the Barcelona Zoo. Four of them tested positive for COVID-19. Veterinary uh, authorities said this on Tuesday. It's only the second known case in which large cats have contracted the coronavirus. The three females are Zola, Nima, and Run Run. And Kiumbe is the male. They were tested after uh, keepers noticed they showed symptoms. Two staff at the zoo also test positive, and uh, the outbreak was detected last month. Authorities are still investigating how the lions became infected. What's mm. the crossover here? Obviously, sex, but right. but who? That's right. <clears throat> well, there's a couple of sus- suspects since two staff members also became infected. Oh, boy, Gerald. Mm. Gerald. Gerald. <laughs> Reared and its who ugly head. And who forced who? Because a cat, <clears throat> when a cat tells you to do something, you do it. Oh, yeah, the cat's cat. the aggressor, yeah. Right. Yeah, you, you cannot rape uh, a Bengal tiger or an African a lion or even a, even a lynx is a bridge sure. too far. Yeah, an um, ocelot, good luck. Yeah, good luck. Bobcat, forget about it. No way. No way. Yeah. You got to do their bidding. And one last cat story, Joe Exotic back in the news. But this is interesting. I think he wanted this to be kept secret. But here we are. So he's trying to get a pardon months before, you know, Trump's out. And so far, no luck. Now he's going to the expert, Kim Kardashian. So he's serving 22 years for hiring a hitman to kill Carol Baskin. We all saw that in the documentary, among other crimes i'm the only he, person on the planet that has not seen 10 seconds don't. of that there's two people don't on the show oh. don't see it no i am yes. not a fan okay. thought it was ridiculous Good. uh it, it, i thought it was just a, a crazy people torturing animals isn't this great no good um so he asked kim to to call donald trump saying this no one has to know you did this <laughs> And yet we're reporting it. Kardashians, <laughs> who's doing um, a four year uh, law apprenticeship to become a lawyer, has successfully lobbied to get several people out of prison. So it's not that uh, far fetched, but I don't, something tells me she's not going to go for this. Uh, it, it'll be interesting. Is she going to take the bar? I mean, it's got to be, she's studying she for it. It's got to be, yeah. got to be there coming. Should be pay per, there should be pay per view. Got to be coming, uh, coming soon. Mark and you know, know, just to let's uh, let's break down the Kim Kardashian game film. You know, like I know it's all comical. Uh, she's gonna take the bar, but she's probably smarter than most people we know. Certainly, uh, I mean, she comes from a strong family. Her mm-hmm. Dad, her dad was a lawyer, right? They've like, got to be shrewd business. They're people fucking making- totally shrewd business people. Uh, their armo, like mm. uh, Garagos. Um, I don't know why. Just because she looks hot in a bikini, would should we be that surprised? I mean, I know she, I, I know how she makes her living. But what I'm saying is, is she's a shrewd businesswoman. She's obviously hardworking and focused and diligent and all that kind of shit. I don't know. I wouldn't be so surprised if she nailed that thing. Yeah. I mean, first of all, we already have evidence that she has gotten people um, not exonerated, but it gotten them out of prison. So that's already happened. And she's apparently quite good at it. Also, I think that what I imagine she probably has a lot of help, you know, tutoring. You know, it's not like she's sitting at home burning the midnight oil. I'm pretty sure she has she can afford to get the best of help for this so why wouldn't she be able to pass the bar and uh i'll tell you if you ever get a chance to head down to garagus's office you'll see seven chicks that look like a kardashian roaming oh, around that it. place oh yeah mm-hmm. all right let's bring it home gina grad you got it i'm gina grad and that's the news gina gina grad. 
That was the news with Gina Grad. Well, let me hit Geico here. Do you own? Do you rent? Do you want to bundle? you want to save money? Go to Geico.com. Makes it easy to bundle your homeowners and renters insurance along with your auto policy. Good thing because you got better things to do. So go to Geico.com. Get a quote. See just how much you could be saving. It's easy when you go to Geico.com. All right, we'll take a break, and then I'll come back. We'll do some Q&As on the stereo app, and we'll do that right after this. Hi, Adam. Hey. We are back on stereo. And uh, while we wait for we're going to do some Q&As like usual. So if anybody wants to leave an audio message and ask Adam something, feel free to do so. And while we wait, Adam, I'm really excited for next week because we are finally doing the reveal for 2020. Most disgusted to have sex with Adam. Mm, yeah, it's everyone's favorite show of the year. And uh, it, it, it is a fun, it is a fun show or a fun week. So, are there any front runners that that you think that you're expecting to see? I uh, I've not seen the list. I've not been abreast, a pardon the pun, of uh, anybody's on the list. There's always some uh, wild cards in there. Um, I was informed that Greta Thunberg is on there and that she might be underage. So I don't know who's uh, who's oh. in charge of cleaning that list up. But we got to check her ID because uh, we may have crossed some sort of line somewhere. We'll have Mark Garrigus take a look at the list to make sure it's... He should okay. vet it. He should vet the list. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's very exciting. It reminds me a lot of my high school days. You know, I know it's a little self-indulgent, but uh, I feel like I'm worth it. You know? You, I totally agree. So that that's what people can look forward to next week. Also, earlier this week, you sent me a link. Um, you were, you've been paying a lot of attention to Paul Newman's watch, which is going up for auction this weekend, mm -hmm. along with, uh, Steve McQueen's watch, both of their watches. And then you've also sent me a link that Carol Shelby's prized watch from the 1959 24 hour of Lamar, uh, his, his watch, what he got, which he got as a trophy was found. Um, and I, I read the article and interestingly, his family wants to keep it. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I always say. Until the uh, gay grandson gets involved, and then uh, we're having a fire sale. That's how <laughs> that's how heirlooms work. Yeah. Hey, look, not, look, there'll be no difference in Is my that... life. Believe me, all those all those Newman race cars <laughs> will be up for sale shortly. I'm sure, because it has to go that way. How, how long? How are you divvying those up? I'm I'm getting buried in all of them. The. Uh, <laughs> No one in my family can even drive a stick. Um, I I actually took my daughter out for a drive last night. She, she, she wanted to go driving. And I said, fine. And we drove all throughout the neighborhood. And she drove pretty good. She's 14. And uh, then I told her, I shall teach you how to drive a stick shift. And then you'll be the only person in your school who can drive a manual stick shift automobile. And she agreed. And I shall teach her. And I am telling you people, if you want to teach someone to drive a manual shift, there's only one thing you have to remember and one way to do it. You have to get them to push in the clutch when you tell them to push in the clutch. It always bucks. It always dies. They never feather the clutch. They never give it enough gas. It's always a disaster. But if you yell your safe word and they push the clutch in, the car won't stall and you'll be rolling forward already, and now you can tell them, put a little more gas now, and now let that clutch out slowly. I'm telling you, just managing the clutch, just saying, here's my word, pushing the clutch. You guys know the story where I did a bit for the car show where I taught some spokes model how to drive a, uh, it was a Viper, it was a Dodge Viper, 650 horsepower. Taught her how to drive that thing, manual shift, took me five minutes. Sat in the car with her for five minutes. We went all the way down the road, turned around, put it in reverse, did a three-point turn, and came back five minutes. That's it. Just yelled out <laughs> yelled out her safe word, pushed that clutch in. You can do it. I, it. The thing that bothers the shit out of me all the time is why why are all adults so stupid? 
Like, I wish when I was learning to drive a stick shift, somebody had mentioned that. It's foolproof. You just yell. You sit in the car when the car's not running. You tell the person, uh, give me your word. Hers was Voltaire. I said, okay, when I yell Voltaire, you push a clutch in. And we just sat there. Push it in. Voltaire. Voltaire. Just did it. Did it 10 times. Then I said, good. Start the car. Voltaire. Push the clutch in. Next thing you know, she's driving a Viper. I'm going to teach my daughter to drive a 270Z in five minutes. Adam, when I was an intern here, uh, we used to get some pretty cool cars coming in through CarCast, and you would film them out in the parking lot. And one time, we got a Nissan GTR right when it was brand new, and and I was still the new guy. And you tossed me the keys. I think it was a GTR, but it was a stick shift. And you tossed me the keys, and you went, "Go ahead, give it a, give it a spin." And you went inside to record a podcast. And I don't know how to drive stick, so I walked outside like, "All right, I'll give it a shot." I got in the car, and then you went into the studio. You came back out, and I tossed you the keys back, and went, "Ooh." Man, that thing can that thing can drive, because I I didn't want you to know that I can drive stick. Good shame, we love shame. Yeah, but it works. A little shame goes a long way. All right, do we All have right. any questions? We got some questions here. You ready? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Ace man, Chris, this is Patrick, a PE teacher, calling from Illinois. Sorry, I didn't say that last week. For both of you, who's been the most surprising guest that you've ever had on? I think of Fluffy, Gabriel Iglesias, and then Tom Arnold thinking all white cops are bad. Those are pretty surprising and crazy. I want to know what uh, both of you guys think. Thanks. Get it on. Hmm. I'm not nostalgic this way. I never really think, like, who's that? Who's that? You know, um, I'll just give an, a nice answer and a tip of the cap to uh, Chris's heritage. Uh, Joe Coy coming up here and doing Bung Lusu. I never laugh so hard. Now, I should get myself some credit for figuring out that he should be auditioning for the floaters. Just the idea that the band is called the floaters. But that Joe Coy doing Bung Lusu auditioning for the floaters, maybe not surprising, but certainly the hardest I've laughed. Max Pata? Um, I'll go off. I'll say uh, who impressed me most off air. There's two of them. So Brian Cranston's one of them. Because in the height of the Breaking Bad days, he hung out for like an hour after the show and just talk, to talk to all, all of the lackeys and the underlings about Breaking Bad because he was fanboying out so much on that show. He wouldn't read ahead too much. So he would, he would give theories of what he thought would happen. And he was just so excited to talk about Breaking Bad with us. So that's definitely a highlight of one of the guests. And also, weird that I just mentioned this the other day to someone, Will Forte who uh, he was a uh, MacGruber and on the last man on earth. Mm -hmm. I remember when he was a guest, he pulled up in a beat up Honda civic. Uh, and then after the show, he also st stuck around because that was when uh, Allison Rosen's, uh, her dog died and he hung out and just listened to Allison talk about her dog for like an hour. It was really, really supportive of her. And I thought that was really nice. He didn't have to do any of that. And uh, I, I don't know. That just stuck with me. Good, good polls. Both of them. All right, let's get another question going. Mm -hmm. Hey, Adam, I had a quick question for you. Regarding Agent uh, Baby Doll Dixon, do you still have to give him a 10% cut, even though he didn't believe in the podcast and has nothing related to a job that he's gotten for you in the past? And also, since Jimmy's had his job for this long, does he still have to give him a cut every single year, too? Um, I'm not totally sure, but the way it works is... Uh, no, he doesn't get a cut of the podcast. Um, and as far as Jimmy's contract goes, you know, if you if you're a sports agent or you're an entertainment agent or whatever, and you make a contract, then you continue to service the contract, as they say. So, if if you're the one who got this guy tons of money every year for hosting a late night show or playing in the NBA, then when that guy's in his fifth year or 23rd year and you made that contract, then you get a percentage of that contract. And I don't know why it would need to sunset because that's the kind you, you formed and constructed the contract. So, uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't sunset. I, I think you keep getting paid a lot of times in television in lieu of 
the talent giving the agency 10% or whatever it is, they make them producers and they end up getting paid from the uh, production. And so they don't have to take it from the talent. Next question. All right. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Paul, 45, Louisville, Kentucky. Let's pretend you're on death row. What is your last meal and what is your last drink? Mm. Bye, guys. Um, Jeez. You know, I, everyone, you know, has their, you know, your Chick-fil-A's and uh, whatever, whatever you like, you know, <laughs> In-N-Out in, in yeah. Burger or whatever. I like all that, but, and I'd always thought that way, but what just popped into my head was the greatest meals from my childhood was Hungarian food. I loved Hungarian food because Laszlo Gorog, my Hungarian step-grandfather, would cook it for me. And I imagine as I sat there, you know, hearing the priest walk down the hall and getting ready to be executed, I would probably be waxing a little nostalgic. You know what I mean? Probably be thinking, hmm, ah, I remember old Laszlo and the old house in North Hollywood and the big orange kettle he brought it out in. And I think I would go for some good, authentic Hungarian food. I'd go with a goulash stew for openers. Then I'd go with the cucumber salad as well. And then I'd go right into a chicken paprikash and uh, no kettle with the, uh, like the dumplings. And I'd, I'd take that sauce and I'd ladle it, ladle it over it. And then at some point, I would be profoundly disappointed because prisons don't make really authentic Hungarian food. And I would then be angry. And then I would then stop and go, fuck it. I want Chick-fil-A. And they'd go, sorry, it's too late. And that's how I would enter the electric chair. Not even prisons, because I've been to many Hungarian restaurants with you. And there are a lot that don't really do it the way that you envisioned it or that you had it as a kid. Yeah, and, you know, who am I to tell them? But uh, I, you, Max Pata, who's traveled the country with me in search of authentic Hungarian, you know when you get it right with the stuffed cabbage and the paprikash chicken and, uh, and the goulash, it is in the no kettle, it is fucking dead nuts on, right? Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's a 10. And I'm surprised that your last meal doesn't have a dessert. How are you going to end it? I mean, I, you just recently announced that you're a cake guy now. Mm. So I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you know, I moved. I'm, I'm, I'm straddling between pies and cakes. I wouldn't call myself a cake guy now. I got to go with apple pie a la mode. French vanilla, hot slice apple oh, yeah. pie. I don't know. who. You ever see these animals? Have you ever seen these animals? Used to see, I used to see them at diners. They do a slice of hot apple pie with a square of American cheese over it. I'm looking at you, Dawson. I oh. bet that's I bet that's one of your moves. I'm like, Bleh. yeah, Dawson's mic's not hot, but go with the French vanilla. So good. You know what the best part about the French vanilla? Yeah, I don't I don't all, get the cheese thing. Yet. All a mode. You know the best part of that is once the ice cream has melted and dripped down the side and formed a little puddle at the bottom of the plate or the bowl, <laughs> and then you got through the good part of the pie. And there's just that hard crust that's left behind that falls down and emulsifies into the uh, liquid ice cream now and drinks up the ice cream so that the crust, which was formerly no good, becomes the best now at the end. Yeah, sop it up. Sop it up. Oh, yeah. I'm like you, Adam. I would go through my hair to do my last meal be Filipino food. I would get some chicken adobo, some dinaguan. Sinagung, and uh, yeah, have have the food that I grew up with. It, it it creates some sort of magic when when you eat it. Thinking about your childhood, kind of like that ratatouille scene where he had he took a bite and all of his memories just came back back to him immediately. So it's a good feeling, and I I think you're on the right track there. But what are the chances the prison is going to make good Filipino cuisine? Well, that's why lobster guts comes second. <laughs> that's that's right. not hard to make. That's true. All right, let's do another question here. Chris, Ace, what's up, my peeps? This is Jay from Dublin, California. 
Ace Man, I've been listening to you forever, and I've always heard you talk about your boxing, but I've never heard a deep dive. I want to know about your journey into boxing, man. Did you make it to Golden Gloves? How did you get into it? How long did you train for? How good were you? Would love to hear about it, my man. Love the show. Keep it up. Well, it started with me um, in, like, my senior year of high school. We used to have these backyard boxing matches in my backyard because it was right next to the school, and we'd stage these. Someone had some boxing gloves. Of course, I never had boxing gloves because that would have been expensive or even a mouthpiece or headgear or anything. But we'd have these, like, backyard boxing matches, and uh, I did a few of those, and I always kind of liked it. I just liked it. And then... uh, Once I got out of playing football, I wanted something that was sort of like a contact sport that I could, but, but, but like, unlike in football, in football, I have to keep like eating and lifting weights and bulking up. And I I like the idea of like weight divisions and you could be at your best weight and so on and so forth. So I had a friend named Rudy and he went to USC and by USC was an old gym called the Hope Street Gym, also called the Olympic Gym also called the Montoya gym. It was the same place. And it was this broken down old three, four story building. I even think they filmed like Rocky, whatever there, like when he had to go back to get in touch with the tough, tough guy roots, you know, and the man, you know, on the street and all. I think they may have filmed at that uh, Montoya gym, but I, they filmed stuff there. Cause it was real gritty, real tough looking old school, like forties boxing gym. And, uh, I signed up there. I used to remember riding my motorcycle there when I was like 18, 18 and a half. And uh, it was like $7 a month or something. It was sort of ridiculously cheap. They had, um, God, I'm trying to think. They had, can you picture this? They had like a big folding table, like a big folding table at the end of the ring. And all the water was in bottles, but there were like Sunny D bottles and milk bottles, any plastic kind of container. They just fill them up from the sink and then put them down there. And everyone in between rounds would just go grab a random bottle, not not your bottle, just whatever the bottle was. People didn't really touch it to their lips. They just sort of held it and dumped it in their in their mouth or the trainer would. And then you'd go back to work. Everything was just like on a on a bell. The bell would ring every three minutes and then would ring again in a minute. So everything would go for three minutes and then everyone would stop for a minute and you'd get, you'd spar a little. I remember it'd be a little scary sometimes be in there. And sometimes the trainer guy would come up and go, you want to move with this guy? And uh, that meant you're going to spar, <laughs> you know, and it was always a little weird. I remember like signs on the wall saying like no spitting on the floor you know, stuff like that, like real gritty and dirty. And uh, I worked out there. I was probably there for about six months. I was pretty good, maybe showed a little potential. And my trainer uh, signed me up for the uh, Golden Gloves. And so the Golden Gloves were going to be at the Olympic Auditorium. And it was going to be in 1984, I believe it was, They had two rings in the middle of the Olympic auditorium and, uh, he signed me up and, uh, I I basically sucked. And that was about the end of my, my golden gloves, uh, career. And then later on, I became a trainer. I do remember one thing from that whole event and, and I was pretty skilled and I was a pretty good trainer, but I wasn't tough enough for that sport. But, um, I do remember one thing very vividly from the doing the golden gloves in, in 1984 at the, the Olympic auditorium, one dude won and he was so excited about winning his fight that he jumped out of the ring. And when I say jumped out of the ring, I don't mean he didn't put his hands on the rope. He literally just jumped. He just sprung himself like a big two big vertical tuber. Those ropes are, they ain't 36 inches. They're 44, 48 inches, 42, you know, above the canvas. And the canvas is three feet above the ground. And there's nothing but folding chairs and stuff down there. Like he just jumped out of the thing and landed amongst the folding chairs. 
stuck the landing, man. Just both feet down at the same time, walked away. Remember that? <laughs> Picture jumping out of a, you know, like a regulation boxing ring. And and, and 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 who was around the ring apron and the reporters and timekeepers and scores, you know, that dude just jumped right out of that ring. And that that's my real recollection of of the Golden Gloves. Yeah, that'd be something I'd, I'd never forget either. <laughs> if um, I always wonder this, too, because if you if you had to if you were in a, a real legit boxing match and I always think of the crazy entrances that the entrances that they do. Uh, what song would you come out to? Because whenever we do stand-up shows, you don't care about the song. Every time a, the manager comes in, what song do you want to go out to? You just go, I don't care. And they just play whatever. Uh, Only Women Bleed by Alice Cooper. <laughs> don't ask me why. <laughs> I just think uh, yeah. <laughs> I just think it would scare the shit out of my opponent, you know? Yeah, just do something in, so wacky and so crazy. That who who the hell would, who the hell would play that? Right. All right. What else? I dig it. All right. Okay. Adam, I'm a fighter pilot, and Ooh. I am ashamed of my fighter pilot bros who have no idea how to drive a stick shift. Toss them the keys to my car. They walk out to it, realize it's a stick, and they're like, "I can't do this." And I'm like, "You're a fighter pilot. You better fucking learn how." Wow, it's funny. Well, obviously, it's based on a conversation we had 20 minutes ago. But, uh, yeah, I think everyone, you know, the thing about driving a stick, well, first off, uh, one day you maybe want to drive a race car, and that's pretty damn fun. And uh, you're going to have to drive a stick if you're going to drive a race car. But uh, I don't know. It's kind of for a dude— I guess it'd be like knowing your way around a barbecue. Like it's just feel like I just feel like it's it's a rite of passage, you know? I just feel like uh I just feel like it's something you should do as a dude. Like you should be able to fix minor things around your house. You should be able to drive a stick and you should know your way around a barbecue. We're live on stereo, <laughs> by the way. If you're uh wanting to ask a question, go ahead, because we're live on stereo. Yeah, well I'm I'm surprised that driving stick is so important to you because with all these uh the self-driving cars that are coming out i imagine that when i have a kid i'm gonna be like you but instead of oh i want her to drive stick it's i want her to learn how to steer mm. it's just the basics that they're, they're never gonna they're never gonna need to learn i gotta tell you um you know it may be a little counterintuitive but driving a stick gets you more connected to the car you're more engaged like you can say, oh, you should have two hands on the wheel and you should be focusing all the time on steering. The easier cars get to drive, the, the, I, I took my daughter out for a ride last night, so I told you. We're driving around. She's pulling her phone out and texting. <laughs> we barely got down the driveway. I'm like, you already started this shit? Like, it's so, I mean, she doesn't even know how to drive a car and she's texting and driving. Like, it is too easy to drive cars these days. And they have all the beepers and all the gadgets and all the warning and the self-braking and all the lane correction and all that kind of stuff. It's putting the drivers to sleep. When you used to drive, you know, when I used to drive my old pickup trucks, man, you had to drive that car. You couldn't. You couldn't be texting and driving that pickup truck. You, you, it needed your full attention. And so maybe, maybe the driving the stick actually engages the driver more. What's next? Yeah. Hey, Adam. Uh, my name's Ish. I'm from Texas. I'm 29. And I grew up watching the fucking man show back when Comedy Central wasn't a lot of bullshit. You and Jimmy Kimmel were the fucking shit. And thank you. Thank you for not drinking and driving. Uh, yeah, I'm glad that people uh, remember the man show and uh, seem to be a part of their childhood. I always get a little defensive sometimes when I talk about the man show because uh, I think people thought of it as, oh, you guys swilling beer and making fun of women. But I always looked at it as just a really funny sketch show. I there's a, a Dr. Drew... I was with Dr. Drew today and he was laughing about, uh, I used to love doing the commercial parodies 
on that show. And I thought they were really well done. Like the art department did a good job. The production was good. Like we, we, and he was telling me about a bit that I hadn't thought about in years, which is called uh, Masculine Out, which is a special <laughs> washing. It was a special detergent that removed protein stains. And it was just one big jizz joke. But the point is, is it was really fucking funny. Like we would take, we would take these really insane premises, like a laundry detergent that was specifically made for teenage boys. And then we would execute it. Like it would be funny, be well executed. We would hire actresses. We would audition people. Like we, we didn't fuck around on that show. Like we were really serious about taking these insane premises and ideas and then executing them. And I think if you go back and you look at some of the, just some of the commercial parodies we've done or some of the sketches we've done, like where Jimmy marries a monkey and stuff, stuff like that. I think you find that stuff holds up and it was really good. And it wasn't just like a weird misogyny kind of frat party. Yeah. And also speaking of teenagers, I mean, your son is, of the age to want some masculine out. And I was curious, have you, have you had that talk or have you, or does, have you noticed him hanging out in the bathroom for long periods of time or, or anything like that? I mean, I, the information is just so obtainable these days. I, do you even, do parents still have to sit their kids down and tell them this stuff? I don't know. I, I came in, I came to his bedroom this morning. He was asleep. Phil, the lab was asleep, like on his feet. And when I woke him up, I realized under his arm, tucked in tight under his arm was Owly Owl, his stuffy. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized, Jesus Christ, when I was in the ninth grade, like I was like uh, trying to find pot and chicks and drink Mickey's Big Mouth at a park. And he's got his stuffy. Alley Al, like under his arm. I think it's a, I, I think it's different, Chris. I, it's just not, we were, we were in such a hurry to grow up. When I was 14, I was like, my parents are assholes. They're broke. This sucks. I got to get out of the house. I got to pretend like yeah. I'm older than I am. I want to meet some dude with a van and hang out and, you know, go to the reservoir and break into it. Like the kind of shit we would do, like let's go get on top of that apartment building and jump into the neighboring pool and just all the fucking juvenile shit we would do. And these kids are hanging around with their stuffies. <laughs> it, it's, it's not the same crew, man. Yeah, I'm in between both of you guys, and I'm much, much closer to you. So this is a totally new thing because I was the same way. The first friend that I that got a car, that was the last you saw of me because I would just be in the back seat of that car driving around with all with my friends, and I never came home. Oh, that's so. yeah. The second and and by the way, it's not like my parents wanted us to come home. Like that that was one less thing for them to <laughs> deal with. We're live on the stereo app, by the way, if you guys want to ask a question. Yeah, no, it was, it was a tacit agreement. My parents didn't want me in the house. I didn't want to be in the house. And thus I was just out. Did I did whatever I wanted. Yeah. It was awesome. All right. Here's another question. Hey, Adam, it's Ivan from TJ. I always wanted to get your take on those old Western movies where a guy goes horseback riding into Mexico and somehow everybody in the bar magically speaks English and they're all like, hi, senor, would you, would we, could we interest you in some cervezas? As a Mexican, I find that a bit offensive. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to get your take on it. Well, just to even it out, every World War II movie had Germans that just spoke English but with a German accent, you know? So... You know, it, it works on the blue eyed devil as well. Like it, it cuts both ways. Yeah, it, it was always funny. But again, you know, I was 13 or nine or five or whatever. It never made a difference. It was like, my friend, you want tequila, my friend. And it's like, it's kind of funny, but it kind of made sense, <laughs> you know. And uh, I don't know why anyone would go into a, a saloon because I've seen. 2000 movies where guys walked into a saloon 
and never without an altercation. I've never, I've never seen a movie where a guy went, yeah, I went to the saloon. How was it? Yeah, it was great. Had a few belts, played a little poker. Anyone cheap? No. Honest game. How'd you do? <laughs> uh, started off with like 40 bucks and I got out of there with like the 40 plus another, like, I don't know, $13 or something. So it wasn't bad. And what about those gals, huh? What else? Yeah, they're nice. Kathy, Sheila, yeah. sweethearts. And uh, no one accused you of cheating? No, why? I just, you're playing poker. Yeah, but these are good guys. These are solid guys. And then at some point at the bar, did some stranger uh, ask you for two fingers of tequila and then get up in your grill? No, no, I had a, uh, I just had a Pepsi free. I want to keep my head kind of straight for the poker game. Uh, no fights? No. <laughs> And uh, no, no uh, the Dalton boys didn't come in there and raise hell. Uh, there was a guy named Dylan, but he seemed sweet. And that was it, huh? Yeah. And uh, there wasn't any situation where, like, talking to one of the saloon girls and then uh, her husband showed up and got pissed off or he's an outlaw or something. Uh, well, I'm married. I'm happily married, so. <laughs> I just played poker. <laughs> oh, uh, we played Texas Hold'em. And uh, I don't know, we, at a certain point, we did Deuces Wild. So we did like a, we did poker, a five card draw, but we did Deuces Wild. And uh place has good beer nuts, by the way. And uh, they're a little salty. Yeah, so great I, apps. I had to have a couple of Pepsi Freeze. But uh, yeah, I have never seen a movie where anyone entered a saloon or bar that didn't either get their ass kicked, get shot, accuse someone of, sh of cheating, and then shoot them, or get punched in the, the face themselves, or punch someone else in the face. I, I've never seen a depiction of this. That must have been a tough business I back in the day. I completely with you. So, <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah, you lose half your clientele every day. And no one ever went into a saloon like in the Old West. And by the way, they would go in at night, winter nights. No one ever went in and went, God damn, it's fucking cold in here. It's drafty. We, we, we should get a door. Has anyone thought about a door? A door? Yeah, like they have at the barber shop and the butcher shop and the sheriff. They all have doors. You saying you want like a door? the top and the bottom would be on there? Yeah, I'm fucking freezing. And they'd go, well, let us get you a table. Not by the door freezing my ass <laughs> off over there and there was never a fire or any heating or space heater or nothing it was just, no one ever complained about how cold it was but you're in a fucking saloon yeah. in montana in january it's got to be brutal i, I, yeah, I I'm don't believe it very suspicious about the lack of door talk <laughs> And that's like their signature thing. That's what makes a saloon a saloon are those yeah. the, the lack of doors. And you know what makes a a business with no doors on it even colder? At some point when there's a fight and you throw the guy through the window. Now we got no fucking window <laughs> or no fucking door and no one ever complained. And by the way, my fucking wife, when she sleeps at night, if the ceiling fan's on, she'll be like, my forehead's cold. None of those saloon girls come down dressed in their bloomers with their shoulders showing. None of them go, it's fucking freezing in here. Yeah. How am I going to blow They're guys upstairs with this fucking... I was blowing this uh, Texas Ranger and there's steam coming out of my mouth. So fucking cold in here. Come on. We got no window. We got no fucking door. This is Montana. This is January, people. Jesus yeah. Christ. And how long before they repair that window? You know, it's interesting. Every single barroom fight, someone gets thrown through the window. Never seen anyone walk down a western town and seen plywood on a window. Why no plywood? Yeah. The night before, everyone gets thrown through the window. How come the next day there's no plywood? How come there's no depictions of guys fixing the window? I I cry phony. <laughs> if that was a real it, saloon, someone would be complaining about how cold it was. Completely true. And All also, right, there's a... Uh, don't get me started on spittoons. All oh, right. man. 
What else we got? Oh, you're listening yeah, uh, live it's on Kimberly stereo. Kimberly here. Hey, Kimberly. Go ahead. Hello, guys. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know who you are, but I am really enjoying the chat. So hopefully I'll get to know you. But yeah, enjoying it. Have a good one. Well, that's a cordial chap. I like that guy. Yeah, very polite. Don't know who you are, but Thanks, I like Keith. I like uh, like my little summer sampler. And uh, thank you. Again, we're li you're uh, listening, and we are live on stereo. All right, how long are we going here, Max Pata? Do you know? Let's go. Let's go to another five minutes here. We got a few more questions. Okay. Hi, Adam. This is Jen, uh, thirty-two, San Diego. I was just curious if you're able to speak about it. How many listeners does your podcast receive every day? I'm just curious the reach and how do you feel about that number? Uh, is it like a hundred thousand Max Pata or whatever the whatever the thing says or two hundred thousand? I don't know. It, what the... Yeah, it's, I mean it's it's really it, it ranges. Like there are some that are hundreds of thousands. There are some that reach a million. Like it, it, and a lot of it is just based off of some like great stuff that you've said that people want to tune into, or it's guest dependent. I mean, it, it varies quite greatly, especially because we do five shows a week. Well, we but, know, I mean, and and we also know like this. not everyone listens that day. The, it accumulates over the course of a week, I guess, and people get to it and listen to it that way. But. Uh, that's as much yeah. answers uh, we got, but thanks and tune in. Why don't you be one of those people? What else? Yo, guys, I'm loving your show, man. I got to get ready to get up out of here. Yo, follow me. I'm following y'all, so let's keep it moving, man. I'm loving it. Love. Wow. wow thanks, Bonds. Thanks, Bonds. You're, uh, we're live on <laughs> stereo, by the way. I should let you know. All right, let's try another. All right, let's see one more. All right. Okay, Adam, please help me, please. Uh, envelope came to my house, and it had a beautiful uh, gold chain necklace with a Tahitian black pearl at the end, and it was addressed to my wife. My wife unwrapped it, and she said to me, Oh, did you give me something? And my fucking dumbass said, Yes, I did, to show my appreciation. Now, Adam, Adam, one, I don't know, I didn't buy that for her. Two, I don't know who did. And uh, three, uh, I just talked to, I called the person that made it because her name is on the envelope. And she's trying to find out who bought it for her so I can buy it back. So I can buy it. So it's like I got it. Right, right, Adam, please, please, please help, help me, help me. Is he playing with a slinky or wearing a lot of bracelets? Obviously, yeah. <laughs> this family knows their way around jewelry. Because yes. she's receiving random bits of jewelry in the mail. This guy sounds like uh, one of my mom's friends with 18 bracelets when I was 14 and walking around the house. Uh, he gets a, a, a pendant with a black pearl in it, right? I, I guess it's it's addressed yeah. to his wife. His wife thinks he got it for her. He then says yes, and now he's contacted the person on the envelope to find out if he can buy it back. I didn't quite get that second part. Yeah, so he contacted the person who made it. Oh, he who doesn't made know who it. Sent it, but okay, uh, he, who made it, and so hopefully he can get the information from there. So he's trying to make his lie the truth. All right. Well, I think that's a goal. And everyone who's in a relationship should be <laughs> striving to make their lie a truth. Uh, I want to thank you guys for listening uh, live on stereo. And yes. uh, we'll do this uh, once a week. Nice job, Max Pata. Nice job to you. Yeah, we'll do it again. Let's do it Wednesday next week. All right. So, till next time, Adam Kroll for Max Pata and Bald Brian. And by the way, you can go to adamkroll.com and find out all the live dates we're playing all over the country and uh check out our youtube page and see all the stand up there oh. mm -hmm. let think. me toss something in too hmm. today or actually today and tomorrow is the last day to sign up for the corolla christmas combo which is your uh, custom you get a custom shirt a bottle of mangria and a corolla calendar signed by the whole staff so uh check that out at corolladrinks.com 
Thank you. And uh, until next time, this is Adam for Bald and Gina and JJ and Chris saying mahalo.